Mummy glamour shots. The amazing truth about that Minoan snake goddess and the strange history of disembodying statues. Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You're listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today's episode is with Lisa Anderson Zhu, the Associate Curator of Art of the Mediterranean, 5th century BCE to 4th century CE at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. This episode was originally recorded in person at the museum back in 2019. Lisa and I discussed some of the fascinating pieces at the Walters Art Museum, including the Baltimore painter, the Dionysus sarcophagi, and the Fayum mummy portraits, as well as the shocking revelation about one of Sir Arthur Evans' discoveries. But before we begin, a quick note to say that you can listen to Lisa Anderson Zhu speak live on the topic of power and politics and art at Classical Wisdom's online inaugural symposium taking place October 24th to 25th. To find out more, please go to classicalwisdom.com. Um, the two of us have just walked around the museum and just looked at this just amazing collection from the ancient world. Uh, and so first off, thank you, Lisa, so much for talking with me today and giving me a fantastic tour of your collection. No problem. Um, now, there were so many interesting pieces uh, that, you know, to be honest, I, I came here yesterday to look around and I couldn't decide what to talk about. So I'm, I'm glad we just looked around. The piece that sort of strikes me at first, especially with regards to its name, and we're here in Baltimore, is the Baltimore Painter Vase. Um, Could you tell me a little bit about this piece and why it's called the Baltimore Painter Vase? Yes, um, the Baltimore Painter Vase is the name vase for the Baltimore Painter. And if you know about um, the naming conventions for uh, Greek potters and painters in the classical and archaic periods, um, they were very often not signing their vessels. There are a few who would sign as potter or painter, like Nicosthenes or Exekius, um, but otherwise uh, scholars would go through later and group together the, the vases that they thought were made all by the same person, and then they would come up with a name for them, and sometimes the name would be based on a convention, like the elbows out painter would obviously paint people with their elbows out, um, or the pan painter is known as the Pan Painter after a scene of Pan, uh, which is actually the the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, that's a very famous painter, but others are named after the the most beautiful or evocative or important, exactly, the just, this is the epitome vase of this this artist, Um, like the Berlin Painter, obviously his name vase is in Berlin, and the Baltimore Painter's name vase is in Baltimore here at the Walters Art Museum. the Baltimore painter was um, a fourth century BCE painter who lived in um, southern Italy. Um, and the name vase is a volute crater. It's actually very large. Oh, it's um, massive, exactly. actually. It's <laughs> so many details. It's pretty, it's pretty um, impressive just right. to be there in person with it. He, um, it would have been a, a tomb marker. And the Baltimore painter is a very prolific fourth century BCE painter. Um, his vase is... Uh, are in many collections and are often um, up for purchase on the art market. Um, in this case, we know not just based on the shape, the volute craters were used as tomb markers for men, but also the imagery on the vase itself um, tells us more that it was it was meant to be for a young man. On one side, there's a young warrior in a tomb, and we think that's the deceased. Um, and on the other side, it gives him this sort of elevated afterlife where there's the young man in the role of Adonis who's in a chariot with Aphrodite in an apotheosis scene going up to Olympus to be with the gods, referring to the story of um, Adonis where he splits his time with Aphrodite and Persephone. And below that we see Persephone looking totally bereft in a much more elaborate uh, monument than the young warrior gets. Um, with Hermes there, the cycle pomp of the souls, sort of consoling her, and then the souls of the deceased around him. And there's so many details on this this vase. It's covered with just vegetal motifs and erotes and souls, but also um, particularly on the side with the tomb of the young man, we, we see people who seem to be bringing offerings 
Um, so there's just so much to this. And so so much details. I mean, I, I remember looking at it and thinking, like, is that a swan's head sticking out over there? I mean, there were so many yeah, molded interesting details. Yeah, details, painted details. Yeah, we, uh, it, our collection of Greek vases isn't terribly deep. Most of our, our great things are already on view. But, like, for me, that is, that is the greatest of our, our, our vessels. Now, I want to go a bit controversial for a moment. Um, I noticed a piece in your Minoan collection, uh, and I, I was looking at it, and it said 16th century BC or 20th century AD. And I was like, oh, this must be a typo. Um, this is, you know, and then when I pointed it out to you, you're like, oh, no, no, that's that's not a typo. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about the this Minoan piece? Because, or I feel like I should be doing, like, bunny ears when yes. I say that, because yeah. uh, I thought that was really uh, interesting. Right, we have a, a golden ivory statuette that um, is the sort of snake goddess type that um, Arthur Evans popularized when he was excavating at Knossos. Um, but while there are, I, I want to say there's more than a dozen, maybe less than 20 of these, these snake goddess figures known that are said to be Minoan, um, none of them are ancient, or none of them are thought to be ancient. There's a really wonderful book. None, by, none, none, none. Yeah, yeah. This is this is blowing my mind. I'm like, this is this is quite a, a revelation, you know. Exactly. Well, um, Ken Lapatin, who is a curator of antiquities at the Getty Museum, um, wrote a book uh, about these figures, um, where he gives this very compelling argument for how these figures were. Um, produced for the art market, essentially. Um, ours maybe has the claim to being ancient ivory, but the gold elements on it are, are modern. And um, actually, we have another um, of one of these figures that's entirely ivory in storage that it just looks incredibly fake. Um, the reason <laughs> why it's still up, I mean, so the, the old label used to just say 16th century BC. Um, and then as I was doing more research, our galleries were installed in 2001, so obviously there's a lot of research that's happened in the last 18 years, and that's the period when this book came out as well. Um, I didn't want to take the piece down mm -hmm. uh, because it's fairly popular, and the ivory and gold are still quite delicate, so we don't want to be moving it back and forth too often. Um, I also didn't want to just take off 16th century BC. It is meant to look Minoan. Um, it is meant to appear that way, um, but it's not. It's, it's, it's certainly a 20th century piece that is meant to evoke this idea of like a mother goddess that, that Arthur Evans was particularly interested in. But, you know, I think it's, it, that is fascinating of itself, that what we, we conceive of the ancient world. And, you know, because if you, if you don't have it up, then people will just continue assuming that these are authentic. So it's yeah. for me to learn that they aren't, like that was the first moment by, by seeing it. So you end up learning more of the truth about ancient art yeah. by, by showing what it's not. We, we do, I mean, we do have in storage a few things that we think are fakes that we wouldn't put on view or, or are less famous. I um, mean, we certainly have a number of pastiches, some that are ancient pastiches as we were looking at um, our... Roman copies of Greek sculpture in marble. Um, many of these things, when we purchased them, um, were combined with different elements to make a more cohesive piece of uh, a more complete sculpture. Um, and as we were um, discussing, that history is also important to the object. That um, sometimes the combination of the wrong head and the wrong body has its own life for centuries. As we have a, a sculpture of of the head of Aphrodite on the torso of Artemis um, that a former curator had wanted to separate the two as we separated many of our other sculptures. We have a lot of... Yeah, I feel like I should, I should just jump in very quickly and say that um, this was something I also wasn't very aware of, that, that you would, people would just sort of mishmash like a Frankenstein-style... Yeah. Um, statues. So here, the Walters, it, they're they're separated now. But um, you were very yeah. pointing out to me that that they came combined in all sorts right. of weird combinations, exactly. uh, and that I mean, I hadn't realized that people had a penchant for combining. <laughs> well, I, 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 for the art market in the the eighteenth century, nineteenth century, um, that's what people were interested in—something that was more complete. And for the most part, they looked believable. 
Um, but we went through a period in the 80s and early 90s where we separated them. It was actually a way to expand the collection because now we have a torso and a head. Um, uh, but one that I'm just delighted that we kept together was this, this Aphrodite and Artemis combo because I've been able to trace it back to the late 1700s when it had arms and legs, mm -hmm. but still the wrong head with the wrong body. Um, and then in the 19th century, it had moved from Rome to Paris where it lost its arms but still had its legs. And then in the 20th century... Ah, <laughs> oh, poor Artemis. Yeah. <laughs> Aphrodite <laughs> combo. <laughs> when, we, when we acquired it, it had lost its legs as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those things I never would have traced or thought about if, if they weren't still combined. So um, how do you know that one piece is Artemis and one's Aphrodite? Like, Just what's the motifs? Mm -hmm. yeah. The conventional type. So the, the torso is very obviously Artemis with her short tunic. Mm -hmm. um, she's in the mode of huntress. Um, nobody else would be dressed like that. And then Aphrodite, it's her hairstyle and the way her face is, is done. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not a known Artemis type. And we can see um, there's a nice cut on the head where they were sort of made to fit yeah, yeah. Um, but you know more others are more obvious right? we have two polyclyton pieces one is the head of Doriferous, the spear bearer which mm -hmm. is a very well-known sculptural type and then the, it had come placed on the body of Diadumenos, a man binding his his diadem and the way the arms of that torso mm -hmm. are even though they're broken off you can see how they're raised okay. to bind the 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 diadem and that doesn't fit with the head, which is this very famous spear bearer type. So um, we display those two next to each other, and I think it's very funny that it's based on the same original Greek sculptor, Polyclitus, um, but in the copies, they're so similar. The marvel was so similar, the scale was so similar. We were able to put them together. Um, um, sticking with the decapitated head theme, uh, I notice also you guys have quite a lot of emperors. Um, can you maybe explain the the way the emperor heads like they had certain types and yeah um so an emperor would have a sculptural type that would circulate in the empire mm -hmm. and people would recognize him based on his sculptures and also his profile on coins and the profiles on coins are also how we have identified the sculptures mm -hmm. um, because they'll say this is Hadrian this is Augustus this is Trajan and then we'll find a sculpture and say oh that looks perfect um, is it exactly what they looked like? Um, probably not, actually. Augustus, um, we have a few sculptures of, of the Emperor Augustus, who was, I think, in his 70s when he died. Mm -hmm. But he's always shown eternally youthful. Yeah. Um, and his sculpture type, the Prima Porta type, which is what we have representations of, um, was very common. He used that from um, the time he became Augustus until he died. Um, so people in the empire would certainly recognize those sculptures that this is Augustus. Would they recognize him if they met him? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, yeah. I actually sometimes compare it to plastic surgery um, in the ways that you would sort of tweak your face to be more idealized, the, idealized, or... beautiful, and then the members of your family especially would tweak their sculptures to yeah create a family resemblance and then even members of the populace might also try to um I don't know if people are doing that kind of plastic surgery. That's well, no, but it, it's, like, it's like a plastic surgery, but yeah. just in, in sculpture. <laughs> well, I love the Marcus Aurelius piece. I mean, I guess he was quite sickly, wasn't he? And then the, the piece looks so, yeah, it's this thick beard, this curly hair. I mean, it's, it looks very healthy. Uh, I, I, I mean, he was a philosopher, but yeah. he was also a general. Um, I don't think any of his portraits show him looking sickly, but um, hit, that head is, is fantastic because it shows the way that sculptors were using their tools. Mm -hmm. um, in the time of Augustus, uh, more than a century earlier, the hairstyles are quite flat mm -hmm. um, with just a little bit of volume, but essentially everything's flat on your head, which is sort of like what you would get with... Um, a bronze sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, but by the time of Marcus Aurelius in the second century, um, they're drilling deeply into the marble mm -hmm. and, and not really, not, it, it's, it's 3D and they're, they're creating depth and shadow and just like 
the sculptural quality of his hair and beard is really outstanding. Oh. And his co-emperor, Lucius Ferris, also has that just really thick curly hair and it, big bushy beard. The details of it, I just thought were astounding. Like, the the, si- the fact that, like, one side of the beard was a bit longer than the other. Like, yeah. like so natural. And then, like, you would see some, the hair is, like, falling over the lip. You know, it's not, like, mm-hmm. perfectly trimmed beard. I mean, it looks very natural i mean it, it that doesn't look idealized i guess no, like why true. why would you make a beard lopsided i suppose <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if it's a sculptural quirk or something that he quite liked and with the sculptures of the empress julia domna there was a head right next to that um you can see bits of her natural hair peeking out under her wig oh wow uh, but, which is something we also see in egyptian art mm-hmm. um and uh, I, I couldn't even begin to give a, a real answer for why. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, now, there's another, you guys have another gem in your collection, which is um, a room just filled with the sarcophagi. Um, can you tell me a little bit about those pieces? Because they were just, the details were amazing, and you have a whole room of them. Uh, they're just, they're really, really stunning to walk and see. Yeah, um, I think the the gem of our collection are our sarcophagi, and I don't just say that because I'm a Romanist. Um, I tell people that, you know, my number one thing, if you only have a minute to run in the museum, look at one work of art and run out, go see the Dionysus sarcophagus in, in, in the sarcophagus room. So what we have, and we're just incredibly fortunate to have these seven sarcophagi, that come from one tomb in Rome that was excavated in the 1880s. Um, we know from inscriptions the families that owned it, the Licini and the, the Calpurnii, and they buried people in the tomb from the first century of our era, um, probably into the beginning of the third century, so over quite a bit of time, and we can see how the tomb changed from one family, um, probably through the female line, to the, to, to the Calpurnii. Um, but when this, this um, tomb was on the outskirts of Rome, near the Via Salaria, in an area that was probably um, partially nice homes and partially mausolea. It was before um, this area was walled off, so these, these objects were actually outside the, the borders of the city when, when they were there. Um, had been protected until the 1880s by the Villa um, Bonaparte, which was owned by Napoleon's sister-in-law, Paulina. Um, Anyway, so work was going on in the the former grounds of the villa. They found the tomb, which had 10 sarcophagi. We are fortunate to have seven, which are mostly complete. And there was even a person still in one of them. Oh, wow. Um, That sounds a bit terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) I was was, was telling someone recently, we're pretty sure he's not still in there, but it's not, I haven't opened it to check. Yeah, yeah. Um, So there were 10 sarcophagi, two are still in Rome, and one is either in Copenhagen or missing. Um, There were a number of inscribed altars Um, And then um, about a dozen portrait sculptures, all in a fairly small area, but um, illustrating the people who lived there. Um, And um, we've done testing on our seven. Um, The marbles are, six of them and six that are in the same style are all Greek marbles. Um, and then the seventh is actually a Turkish marble, and it's also done in a Turkish style. Wow. Um, that, so it probably imported and then carved, um, finished carving in, in Rome. But none of them seem to be from the same workshop. They show mythological imagery. A lot of it relates to the cult of Dionysus um, or Bacchus with this idea of rebirth. But um, we're not entirely sure. There's, it's getting a little bit problematized whether or not the families were worshippers of Dionysus or whether it was um, convention, convention yeah. appropriate. Um, three of the sarcophagi that we have are small and thought to have contained children. Um, and the imagery on one of those directly relates to child births, yeah, like the birth of there. Dionysus, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and then um, others relate to the idea of um, triumph over death or um, sort of rebirth as the the, the spouse of a deity. So we see Ariadne and, and Dionysus, and she wakens on the island of Naxos and then goes on to be, to be his bride. Um, the Dioscuri, who are abducting their, their brides, the daughters of Leucippus. Uh, but the greatest one is the triumph of Dionysus. Oh, yes. This one, uh, I mean, it's the details. And 
for me, the, I mean, there's these elephants. They're just fantastic. And there's a lion and there's a giraffe. I'm, uh, I should let you explain no, no, more. It's just uh, fantastic. It, yeah, the, the, the details on this one are amazing. So the longest epic poem to survive from antiquity um, is actually about... Um, Dionysus's campaigns in um, India where like he goes there and he fights against the people of India and that's also where he learns to make wine um, and so what we have is the sort of the main part of the sarcophagus is this Roman triumph in the mode of what a general would do coming back to Rome but it's everything is tweaked to be details about Dionysus so he's in a chariot drawn by panthers and instead of his his soldier instead of soldiers he has his troops who are minads and satyrs and they also have captives and spoils. So there's people on the backs of the elephants who are captives. And then a really wonderful detail where there's a wine jar on its side and you can sort of see into it. Um, but the elephants are um, Asian elephants. Mm -hmm. um, instead of African elephants, we can, we can tell that very clearly based on the ears. Um, the giraffe, even though um, you would not find that in India, it was part of sort of the ancient conception of India at the time, but there's all these wonderful details of life in mm. contrast with the death. And then on the top of the sarcophagus are images of the birth of Dionysus and his rebirth, which is why he was appropriate for the sort of afterlife cult, um, where his mortal mother, Semele, um, was tricked by Hera, Juno, into asking um, Dionysus's father, Zeus or Jupiter, to uh, appear to her in her his natural state, which was a bolt of lightning when mm -hmm. she got zapped. So we have a, a fairly rare image of Simile on her deathbed, and they extract um, the infant from her and then implant him in the thigh of Zeus, and then we have another scene where Zeus is sitting there, the baby's been extracted from him, re reborn, mm -hmm. and then um, Hermes or Mercury is, is taking him off to hide amongst the nymphs from, from jealous Hera. Uh, it's it's it is it's just a beautiful piece. Um, another one that I really enjoyed just seeing in person is the Fiam mummy portraits. Um, and I guess maybe we do a recap for those who don't know what the Fiam mummy portraits are. Um, they're uh, well, I'll let you oh, actually yeah. explain it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in Egypt, there was uh, for millennia the um, tradition of having um, sort of an idealized face to cover your coffin. Just think about King Tut, essentially, yeah. and like his very idealized um, funerary mask. Um, in the Roman period, or in, in Roman-controlled Egypt, um, this was changed. It was no longer completely idealized, but what we started to see was what looked like real people, the, the faces of people that you might meet on the street. There are about a thousand of these mummy portraits known. They're painted on wood in an uh, would be wrapped to the mummy with um, linen bandages, and then they just sort of went on where the face was, right? Exactly. So you, exactly. Sort of like a uh, just so you know which mummy it is. You know? <laughs> well, but, but the mummy would also usually have the name somewhere, though that doesn't yeah. often survive. But what's very interesting about these these mummy portraits, which which look very naturalistic to our eyes, especially compared with what the Egyptians were doing before that. Um, is that we're not actually sure that's what the people looked like when they died. Mm -hmm. So in instances where the bones survive with the mask, sometimes there's a mismatch of age and the bones will be older than the mask. Most people are shown sort of in the prime of life. And I should also say all of them have their eyes open and look alive. Um, there are a few older in individuals um, but everyone seems to be alive and healthy. Is that what you would expect if someone yeah. had just died? Um, when there are examples of, of mummy portraits of children, they look sickly and sad, and mm -hmm. so it's very possible those were painted posthumously. Um, but yeah, so it's the idea, like, so do you go to the mummy portraitist at some point in your lifetime and say, make me beautiful? Um, this is a note to everybody. Go to your mummy portraits now right. while you still get a chance. Right, yeah. while, while you're looking good. Yeah. You know, it, and it, it's probably something... Don't wait till it's too late. You want to get your portrait done now. Yeah. Right, you don't want them to wait until you've been dead a week. Yeah. Um, right. But, so people... We're also not sure if they were um, depicted wearing things they actually wore because the garments are often very rich looking. Like mm -hmm. Women are very often wearing purple and really um, expensive looking gold jewelry. Um, we have a mummy portrait on view right now 
that has a big medallion. Um, and in the center there, it looks like a small gold coin. Mm-hmm. Um, at the Detroit Institute of Arts, they have a mummy portrait, probably by the same artist, with the exact same necklace. Mm-hmm. So did the two women who are shown own identical necklaces, or did the mummy portraitist um, just say, oh, you know, I'm going to put this, I have this great necklace, why don't I just draw it on there? There is at least one example I know of where on the back of the mummy portrait, um, the artist made some notes like, add some more gold, do the, oh, do really? the outfit like that. So yeah. it, it, it could be sort of like going to a studio um, and they would, okay, I have, I have purple garments or I have ah, um, a toga on, with a purple yeah. stripe. Why don't you wear that to show your romanitas? Or your but would everybody have gotten portraits done or would it be something that only the rich would have done? Uh, it's a fairly elite practice. Yeah. I think the poor would not have done. I mean, mummification... Um, while in the Roman period would be much more accessible than it was previously, I think would still cost some money. Um, now, I, can you just explain very quickly um, why we have paintings? Though? I mean, it's very rare you have these paintings in wood that uh-huh. the paintings survived this long. Sure. Uh, and then we don't have many examples of paintings elsewhere. That's why they're so unique in a way. Um, we do have examples of paintings. They are quite rare, and it is because of the material. Um, and they survive in Egypt due to the climate. So um, it's all about the very dry, arid regions and the heat, and, and also being um, undisturbed yeah. for centuries. Because the Faya mummies, was, uh, they're all found in the same area. That's yeah. why they're... For the most part, yeah. yes. They're found um, uh, around the, the area of the Fayum. Wasn't there like a story that the the archaeologists sent some guys in advance to go and find them, and it was really cold and they burned some to keep themselves warm. Right, there are a lot of stories about um, the terrible atrocities that Victorians and others committed on mummies. Um, That's from, not- <laughs> right, from burning them or burning them for um, for I think the the railways, um, but also there's a pigment called mummy brown and. Um, they, they think that the, the brown of the picnic came from ground-up mummies. Oh, wow. Yeah, wasn't there a time period, too, where people thought ingesting powdered mummies would be like a cure-all? Yes. That's weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was not only destructive and terrible, but also incredibly stupid. Yeah, that doesn't sound very yeah. good for your health. I'm, I'm sure that didn't really work out for them. No, I mean, it's amazing that they did it for as long as they did. Yeah. I just, it's amazing we still have mummies left. Yeah. Well, it's weird to think of a craze of let's eat mummies. I don't know. History. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Um, okay, well, uh, just to, to finish up then, um, could you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing here in Baltimore at the Walters Art Museum? Um, what are you working on now, basically? Ah, yes. Yeah. So um, there's a collection of about 5,000 objects that I'm responsible for uh, from Near Eastern, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman art. Um, so what I do is to um, catalog things a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Many, we have a thousand objects on view, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of those things are actually quite well cataloged and, and well known. Um, but many of the things in storage are less well known or haven't really been looked at. Um, Henry Walters, who's our founder, died in 1931. Um, and he'd been such a prolific collector of objects, um, which for the most part, he didn't really enjoy. Um, he had a palazzo building um, built in the early 1900s where he displayed most of his collection. Um, but when he died in 1931, there were boxes and boxes and boxes that were unopened. Um, so early, early curators spent time just doing sort of triage and getting a sense of, of what things were in the 1930s. Um, and then we come to today where um, some of these things haven't been worked on since then. Um, and so recently I've been working on um, cataloging our 500 ancient gems Wow! <laughs> um, and just getting basic information about those and we hope those will go online. Um, we have 300 cylinder seals and I'm working with a fellow right now who's helping us to identify the scenes and the cultures. Um, but one of my favorite discoveries is a, a Roman period stele from, from Greece. Um, which is the funerary stele of Antaeus Milesios. Oh, yes, I did want to bring this one up. Yeah, yeah. Um, We purchased this in 1924, and as far as I know, it's never been on view. 
Um, and I recently had the opportunity, something was going on loan and I wanted to um, replace it on view. So looking around for something that was appropriate for funerary sculpture, um, particularly from Attica, Greece, um, I came across the stele, the tombstone essentially. That um, It's from the Roman period. Um, Roman period tombstones fortunately are very um, conventional in their um, depictions. So it, it is quite they were still following essentially the conventions of the classical period. So it fits in visually very nicely um, with the classical period funerary sculpture. Uh, but it shows two men looking at each other. Um, there's palm trees in the background, which were slightly inexplicable. Um, and then dogs below them, and the dogs are, one is looking up and one is looking down. And they're sort of showing the emotion of the scene, sort of this longing and sadness while the men are very classicizing, but also stoic. There's no expression in their faces. Uh, only one of them is labeled Antaios Malesios, um, but his partner is holding a rabbit. And um, I see that as an indication that the two men were in a relationship with each other. Um, we see rabbits in classical vases as love gifts. Rabbits and roosters are probably the most common. Um, so if you love your partner, you know, this, this, you no know, chocolates, no roses. Yeah, yeah. Happy Valentine's. Here's a rooster. Here's a rooster. Don't spend it all in one place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, but so. Uh, Not actual advice. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, the tombstones often take their cues from what we see in vase painting, or maybe vice versa. But there's a lot of similarity um, in what we see in vases, and also in tombstones, and then this continuity. So looking into this idea of a love gift on tombstones, I've found about five which show um, either literally giving a rabbit or someone holding a rabbit that seems to be this sort of subtle nod to the relationship between the two people, mm -hmm. um, this sort of open secret. Um, they're, they're not hiding anything. It wouldn't be um, particularly condoned for two men of the same age to mm -hmm. be in a relationship like that, but at the same time, people in the past are exactly the same as people today, and of course there were relationships like that. Um, so yeah, this is this will leave up um, long term as a representation of um, different kinds of relationships, trying to show the the the, the diversity of that you do find in the ancient world. Exactly yeah. to speak more also to modern audiences as they're coming through. Well, I think uh, it's an absolutely amazing collection. Um, I would advise everybody to come to Baltimore to see it. Uh, the museum's free. Yes, so you can, always free. You, you can come in whenever you like uh, for just even a few minutes, you know, catch a mummy and portrait and, and then head out if you need to. But um, I'll put links down below as well to the, to the museum. And uh, just want to say thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much. <laughs>